saying mate gets me around a lot of things because learning the names is almost impossible. Um, <laughs> but again, it's about trying to create as many connections. There's no place on earth I, would, I wouldn't want to be with right here, you know. My guest today is a gent who's taken the footballing road less travelled. Honestly, the air miles seldomly flown. A coach on an epic journey from Greece to Australia to Japan to Scotland and now to the Premier League in North London. He's an emotionally articulate leader, a meticulous visionary who's proven to be a transformational culture changer at almost every stop. And he's now Tottenham Hotspur's new manager. It's a joy to say Yasu to Mr Ange Postacogli. G'day Rog, how are you mate? Oh, I'm so happy to see you, Ange. Well, let's start at the very beginning. You were born in Greece, emigrating at an extremely young age to a working class suburb of Melbourne, Australia. And the source of your love for the game of football was your father, Demetrius. You've said that the only time you saw any joy in him was when he went to see the football on a Sunday. And so you used the sport to get close to him. Does that describe your belief about what football at its core really is? Making memories, connecting parents to their children. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it wasn't just joy. I, I, I witnessed frustration, anger. It just he came to life, <laughs> mate, you know, and because uh, he's kind of, you know, fallback position on a daily basis was just being tired because, you know, God love the man. He just worked hard for his family, you know, like my mum. And, and, and it, it, there wasn't a lot of sort of emotion around the house so um, going to the football just brought him to life and I loved that you know I loved what it did to him because I saw kind of probably the man he was um, you know prior to you know making this enormous sacrifice of taking his family uh, halfway across the world so even as a young boy and and you kind of go well how you know maybe I'm sort of romanticizing it a little bit now but you know I, I, I firmly believe it resonated with me even as a you know six or seven year old that you know football Football was the connector there, you know, and um, because of that, uh, it, it stayed with me my whole sort of life as a as a as a guiding principle, you know, it, and particularly around football, what it can do. Like you said, it is. It's it's more than the sport. It's a it's a connector. You spent your playing career as a defender at South Melbourne Hellas, joining age twelve in nineteen seventy eight. It's a local club with Greek migrant roots. You became captain, four caps for Australia, but most crucially. At Hellas, and this is bloody incredible, you were coached by Hungarian legend Ferenc Puskás, the icon who gave his name to the Goal of the Year award. You even served as his translator, occasional chauffeur, since he spoke better Greek than English. What was the most important thing that you took from Puskás as a manager? How did he inform your footballing philosophy? The bizarre sort of um, world that, that, that sort of encompassed my sort of journey is in football was that one of the world's greatest footballers literally landed on our doorstep mate and it's just you know in, in a backwater in terms of in football in terms of, of a country like australia and um you know i've said many times that the greatest lesson he, he taught me is just you know how humble he was and when you are that way the impact it has on those people around you particularly if you're sharing a, a space with him where you're working with him and you know, I've met plenty of people who had, you know, very sort of minor significance in footballing terms who felt, you know, they were above us in many respects, trying to get some connection with us and it just never worked. And it hasn't in my whole career, you know, I've met many successful people who I walked away fairly underwhelmed by, by their <laughs> presence, but not with, uh, not with a great man, you know, he was such a... Like I said, such a humble person. He, he, he landed on our doorstep. We, we were constantly at him about to tell us stories about World Cups and European Cups and Real Madrid and, and the Hungarian team. And, and he, he, just, he just loved sharing those stories, but in the most humble way. And we wanted to play for him, mate. And that, that made an impact on me because I think when you have that connection with players, and I've tried to do that myself in my own way, um, it, it makes for a really powerful force. And his basic football philosophy of, you know what, the, the whole sort of end game is to score more goals than the opposition um, <laughs> was brilliant, you know, because that's all we tried to do every week, you know. We, we conceded three as long as we scored four. The boss was happy, you know, and, um, and that stayed with me. 
God, after retiring due to injury age 27, you dove into management, first as an assistant and then title winner at South Melbourne Hellas, stints in charge of the Australian youth teams and in the Greek third division, you ended up at Brisbane Raw, unleashed your now patented approach. You allowed some key star players to leave with immediate effect from a team that had nearly won the league the year prior after a wobbly, turbulent start. The team just soared. The Raw won the Premiership and the Championship in the 2010-11 season, went on to record a 36-match unbeaten streak, earned the nickname Raw Salona in the process. How would you go about, Ange, getting players to buy into your vision? What's the secret? The core component of it is they have to believe in me. Like anything in life, you can have all the knowledge in the world and, and all the greatest intent in the world, but if people don't believe in you as a person... Um, they're like unlikely to jump on board, uh, you know, whatever sort of journey you want to take them on. And so I think the one thing I've has been consistent with me, particularly since those Brisbane days, is wherever I've been is, you know, in the early bits when, when you know, it's fair to say that most people are not sceptical, but will certainly be questioning the kind of methodology I have and the football I want to play, uh, is that there's real clarity that, they understand I'm not going to change. I'm not going to change. This is who I am. This is what I believe in. Um, we're going to hit some rocky times. There'll be plenty of questions uh, thrown at us, but we're not going to change. And uh, I think once people see that, that you know, I, I just don't want them to play this football because I, you know it's something that is a fad or a trend. It's because of what I believe. Um, then they, there's a security there that allows them then to say, all right, we're, we're all in on this. And uh, yeah, that's a key part of everything I do at the beginning is not just the players, the staff, the people I work with at the football club, even the supporters that, you know, they gain, a, gain a, some sort of belief in me as a person that, OK, he, he kind of he's all in on this. So if he's all in on this, we're going to be all in as well. A shock move to Melbourne victory. The next step on the way to taking over the Australian national team. You led them to a credible third place in the 2014 World Cup of death and then guided the Socceroos who qualification for the next World Cup, but left six days later, citing burnout. Cue another bump to your air miles, because next, to Japan, and you led Yokohama F. Marinos from near relegation to the title in just two seasons. And I love this, because pro locker rooms, they're complex places, global places, and you said you learned to give your team talks there in English, simultaneously translated into Japanese, Portuguese and Thai, four people talking all at once. So you kept it simple, skipped the Churchillian speeches. What did you learn about communication from this Japanese league experience? Yeah, look, it was, um, it was, it was an unbelievable experience for me in that you know, I had I had used communication as a pretty powerful tool up until that point, and then it's taken away from you, and you got to get creative. And um, I, le- I learned to do some pretty basic uh, stick figures to illustrate a message, which I found was was pretty powerful while telling a story. Because as you said, uh, while I was talking, there was four other people talking as well, and it can be pretty distracting. But having the visuals while I'm telling the story helped that, um, and and it just. It also made me realise that, you know, it's what I love about the game and, and it's kind of allowed me to evolve as a person more than a manager, but irrespective of what cultures we come from, what upbringings we have or values we have, there are some common themes there around, you know, building something special, selling a dream that resonates with everybody, you know, and uh, you know, that's what I tried to, to sort of test myself in that environment and, and with language taken away I was still able to sort of create that environment and we're, we're players um, who've more often than not didn't have a clue what I was saying still understood the message <laughs> and uh, a lot of it was just me as well you know the way I behave because it's one thing sort of talking about values and behaviours but if they see it in you if I talk about hard work and they see that I'm the first one in the foot building and the last one out then I don't need to say it, you know, they see it themselves. If they see me really passionate about what we're doing, then I don't have to tell them about passion. They can see it and live it. it, Viewers, Google Ange's speech to the Australian youth team, about which a full-length documentary will one day be made. But finally, back to Europe with Celtic in Scotland. And Ange, you arrived with plenty of fans doubting you, your background, your methods, But you anged up the squad. You changed the guard on the roster. That trademark shaky start before unleashing the buccaneering football. And of course, cue back-to-back titles. 
the last coming in a domestic treble. Ange, when you arrive, people doubt you. The media doubt you. You're Australian. Your resume is underestimated. Ange, what do you do with doubt? It's brilliant, isn't it? Um, because that just means they're underestimating me, and I love that. You know, it's exactly <laughs> the space that you know I can take advantage of. Um, I, I get it. You know what? If, if I was on the other side of the fence, I'd probably have the same sort of questions because, like you said, uh, I don't have a traditional background uh, coming from from Australia, and um, everywhere I've worked, there's always been the question of, well, he's going up a level, and I've never seen it as that. You know, I don't think I'm going up a level. I just think I'm. I'm tackling a new challenge, a new experience. And I think I have an advantage over others in that because of my unusual sort of pathway, I've had more experiences than just about every other manager on the planet. You know, I've, I've, I've managed in just about, you know, I've been to just about every country in the world. I've done FIFA World Cups, World Youth Cups, World Club Championships, Asian Champions League, Confederations Cup, you name it, I've done it. And not that I've been successful in all of it, but I've had that experience. So. Yeah, you know, wherever I go, I, I get that there's some scepticism, but I kind of use that to my advantage. I think it's a, it's a good way, and and it, it, it kind of keeps me on my toes as well because everywhere I go, I have to prove myself again. You know, whereas maybe if I had a more traditional sort of um, journey and had success before, maybe that would make me complacent. Um, so one thing I'm not, I'm never complacent. This summer, in a headline ripped out the NBA, you transferred from Celtic to Spurs. Your first day on the job as manager at Tottenham Hotspur, I'm curious, what was it like? Because I know the Kane issue has been every Tottenham fan's obsession, but what's top of your agenda? Yeah, no different to any other. I love that analogy, by the way. There's no David Robinson here, just in case you know. <laughs> it, it, would have, it would have been good, but I uh, love these, uh, love these basketball. Um, yeah, no, look, um, it, it's, it's no different for me. It's kind of, I love this bit. I love the new challenge. I love walking into a place and... Again, you know, it's probably something unique to me. I don't take a group of staff with me. So I literally walk in by myself into these sort of massive football clubs. And I love the energy that that brings to me. You know, I, I have to make make sure that all my senses are super alert to to listen, to, to hear everything that goes on, to see everything that I need to see to make the decisions that I need to make. And then to get people to believe in me. So, you know, engage with as many people as possible. Um, and it was no different here. Obviously, the magnitude of this football club is bigger than, than any other I've had before. So there's more people. Um, saying mate gets me around a lot of things because learning the names is almost impossible. Um, <laughs> but again, it's about trying to create as many connections as I can. And I love it. It's no different here. Um, you know, there's some fantastic footballers here, great staff. It's the training ground and, and the stadium itself are just world class and, and you know, I, there's no place on earth I would I wouldn't want to be with right here, you know, in this minute of uh, trying to bring success to one of the biggest football clubs in the world. No, David Robinson, bite your arm off for a Luke Longley. And how have you tweaked your approach for the Premier League and England? Are there any singular intricacies that you're preparing for? No, I think a lot of that is just will happen organically. I'll, I'll find out along the way if I need to tweak things. Um, the beginnings are always the same. It's about, you know, playing a certain way, having certain values in, in the way we, we approach things, training a certain way, which is obviously different to, to what the players here have been used to. So all those kind of things are, are, the, are the major pillars at the moment. Well, you know, the, any adjustments I've made in my career um, for all the leagues I've been to has happened organically. I've kind of, I've allowed it to grow itself. And then, you know, if we find any impediments along the way, then we'll make adjustments. But you know, I'm not going into it with any preconceived ideas about what we need to change. Uh, what won't change is the basic underlying principles that yeah, I want my team to, to play football that scares the life out of every opposition, mate. That's, that's kind of the end game. And can you address not me, but Spurs fans around the world? Tell them what they're in for this first season under your leadership. What kind of journey should they buckle up for? Yeah, the first thing is buckle up. It won't be smooth. Um, it never is in my, my kind of first years. Um, not to say you can't be successful, but yeah, there'll be some 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 turbulence there. But um, yeah, they, you know, I've said already they're they're going to be my biggest sort of barometer as to how we're going. You know, they fans uh, are, are usually the best judges because they're the most invested. You know, um, experts and 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 people from the outside can have opinions, but. The ones that matter the most are the ones who, who you know are going to be there long after I'm gone and, and, and have been here long before I came. And, um, you know, they'll, they'll let me know how I'm going and 
hopefully they'll see a team that, that gives them belief and hope. Um, hopefully they'll see a team that resonates with what they want to see in their football uh, sides. And that's what I try, I'm going to try and bring. And uh, along with that, some success. Uh, what that looks like tangible-wise, uh, we'll see. Ange, you are truly a unique bloke carved out of the distinctly human stuff. To you, your team, Godspeed. Good on you, Rog. Great talking to you. Listen to the full version of this podcast and all our podcasts wherever you get your pods. But first, subscribe here for more Men in Blazers videos and courage. Go, go, go.